One of my favorite pieces of news to get these days is that a friend of mine is either pregnant or is trying to get pregnant thinking about having a kid. It's something that's just so exciting, especially once you have kids. And one of the sadder pieces of information that I get sometimes is that somebody is struggling to try to get pregnant and have a kid. They're, they're struggling with some aspect of their fertility. And it's something that's starting to get talked about a little bit more. People are starting to become aware of this growing issue or challenge around fertility, especially in the West. The tough thing is that unlike a lot of the other, not necessarily chronic diseases, but health challenges that have become more prevalent over the last 50 to 100 years, it, fertility can be an awkward one to talk about. It's something where people might be kind of embarrassed to bring it up to anybody but their closest friends and family. And it's not something that is obvious when you look around like obesity. But the truth of the matter is, fertility is becoming a growing problem in the West and not necessarily in a population replacement uh, type way, although that, that is a concern to a lot of people too, but in the literal biological, physical sense of people are just generally much less fertile than they used to be. And even if you're not thinking about having kids, if it's not on the horizon, it matters because it, it's a very strong leading indicator for health. In the book that we're going to talk about today, uh, Countdown by Shauna Swan, Dr. Shauna Swan. Well, let me just read you, you know, this quotation on the cover. An essential book for this moment. I sincerely hope that everyone reads Countdown. The younger, the better, so that they'll have the chance to preserve their fertility. And that's really why I wanted to pick this book to cover on Nat's Notes this week, because obviously it's very different than some of the more philosophical, higher level books we've talked about over the last few weeks. It's, it's very practical. It's very modern. But I think it's a real thing that we need to be concerned about and that more of us should know about and be comfortable talking about. Because if we don't know about it, if we can't talk about it, then we can't do anything about it. And one of the things that I love about this book is that not only does it do a very good job laying out the problem, which and I'm going to explain all of that, but it also talks about things that we can actually do about it. It's not hopeless. Some of this stuff we do understand where the problem is coming from, and there are actions that we can take to help ourselves or our community overcome some of these challenges. The other thing I love about this book is uh, Dr. Swan is 87 years old. She's been studying this her entire life, and she published this book a few years ago, bringing her life's work together into these 250 whatnot pages. And that's insane. <laughs> That's one of the most magical things about books, that you can get the entirety of a researcher's life's work in this one little book. And for you, you could maybe just get it in this video or podcast, and that's even better. Because this information is important, these data are important, even if you think it doesn't apply to you, it will apply to somebody in your life almost certainly at some point. And I think it's worth knowing this information and talking about it. And before we dive in, though, I will warn you that uh, some of what Dr. Swan says is controversial. One of the things that she points to is that certain things like the rise in gender fluidity or gender dysphoria might be related to some of these same things that are causing our decline in fertility. So it's going to be up to you to decide how compelling you find that argument, explore it further. I am simply sharing what she explains in the book. And if you want to dive into it further, people have argued about this kind of ad nauseum online, and it is another interesting topic worth exploring. Why don't we just dive right into the book? How bad is this problem actually? Because you might have heard that there was this fertility crisis, the birth rates are dropping, the fertility rates are declining, but what are the actual numbers on it? Well, Dr. Swan has uh, compiled really all of the important ones for you right in the book. There's this great line that I think encapsulates the problem that we're going to talk about. The problem isn't that something is inherently wrong with the human body as it has evolved over time. It's that chemicals in our environment and unhealthy lifestyle practices in our modern world are disrupting our hormonal balance, causing varying degrees of reproductive havoc that can foil fertility and lead to long-term health problems even after one has left the reproductive years. Similar effects are occurring among other species, adding to widespread reproductive shock. Simply put, we are living in an age of reproductive reckoning that is having reverberating effects across the planet. So and I love how she frames this. It's clearly not human problem. It's that there's something in the environment that is doing this to us. And it must be something relatively recent. And it must be something that 
could affect other animals as well. Because as she talks about in the book, we're seeing similar things happen to domesticated dogs, which is kind of crazy, right? Like if dogs are also becoming less fertile, then it must be something more complicated than simply what humans are eating or doing, or than what some of the like wackier conspiracies want to have you think is the issue. So the most, the most compelling number to keep in mind is what Dr. Swan calls the 1% effect, which is reading from the book, the fact that the rate of adverse reproductive changes in males is increasing by about 1% per year. This includes the rates of declining sperm counts and testosterone levels, increasing rates of testicular cancer, and the projected worldwide increase in the prevalence of erectile dysfunction. On the female side of the equation, miscarriage rates are also increasing by about 1% per year. So all of these numbers have been going up by about 1% per year since... I believe she says the 1970s. It's been about 50 years that this has been continuing. Between 1973 and 2011, sperm concentration dropped more than 52% among random men in Western countries. Meanwhile, the total sperm count fell by more than 59%. They got to these numbers. This wasn't just like one study. They looked at 185 studies involving 43,000 men that had been conducted over a 38-year period. And these weren't people who were selected for their fertility status. They were people who were seeking fertility help. These were basically just random samples across Western populations. So think about that again, like 52% concentration drop and 59% count drop in 50 years. So there's something's clearly wrong there, right? It's a, it's a very frightening number that sometimes when you hear these numbers, you have a hard time of like understanding what that means in context. Well, it's startling and chilling when you realize that the number of children you may be capable of having is slightly less than half of that your grandparents could conceive. And it's also shocking that in some parts of the world, the average 20 something woman today is less fertile than her grandmother was at 35. And this is aside from most people in the West having children later, right? My grandparents had their first kid at, I think my grandfather was 21 and my grandmother was 19 or maybe she was 20. That, that seems insane today, right? People are often having kids a little bit later. My, my wife and I had our first kid when uh, I was 29 and she was 27. And that seems like super early, right? Uh, and so not only are we having kids later, but we're actually less fertile while having kids later. It would have been easier for our grandparents to have kids at 35 than for our generation because of how steep of these drops we're seeing. So it's getting harder by default and we're making it even harder on ourselves by often starting later, which kind of compounds into a lot of these challenges that we see today. In a study published in 2016 involving 9,425 specimens from nearly 500 men, Researchers found a significant decline between 2003 and 2013 in sperm concentration, motility, and total count. So not a huge number, right? Only about 10,000 people, but a significant decline. This is the more interesting one to me, which is that while 69% of aspiring sperm donors made the cut in 2003, only 44% did in 2013. So a third fewer made the cut, uh, despite that the more recent group of guys actually had better lifestyles, such as a decline in alcohol use, smoking, and body weight, and an increase in steady exercise. So these guys were doing all these things right, but they still only qualified two-thirds as much as the people 10 years ago. But that's kind of shocking and concerning. So not only have some of these counts gone down, but we've actually been massaging some of the terminology around what good enough is to make the problem seem less bad. And this is a common thing that happens in health markers, they'll often get moved over time based on people getting unhealthier and doctors and medical authorities wanting to like ease the judgment criteria or if they want to prescribe more drugs. So you can see this most closely with cholesterol medication where the, the line for high cholesterol has come down quite a bit as the industry for cholesterol lo lowering drugs has increased. So they've made it easier and easier for doctors to prescribe the drugs because they make more money, right? Like there, there's some adverse incentives at play there. And there might be some uh, weird incentives here with trying to make the problem seem less bad than it is. The World Health Organization's reference value for the lowest sperm concentration that's compatible with fertility, meaning it takes less than a year for a man and his partner to achieve a pregnancy, has declined over the last 30 years. Our idea of what is a good enough concentration has gone down. It used to be 40 million out per milliliter. Then it was lowered to 20 million in 1980 and 15 million in 2010. For the sake of comparison, back in the 1940s, 60 million was considered adequate. So that's gone down by 75% in 70 years. One of the only compelling reasons they would do that is, again, to make the problem seem smaller. Like, or it could be that 
it's actually lower than we think it is. But the fact is that people are having these problems conceiving. And often if you go to like a doctor's office and you try to get treated for low sperm count and try to do something to improve it, I believe the reference range they want you to aim for is about 100 million. So 15 million is quite low. And this is true for a lot of biomarker type things. I know, for example, like with vitamin D, I think the recommended range is, what is it, 20? It's 20 whatever the metric is. I can't remember off the top of my head. But a lot of like more health focused practitioners will recommend getting it up to like 60 or 70 because you'll just feel better overall. Uh, same thing with like protein intake, right? The, the minimum recommended protein amount is just enough for you to survive, right? It's not the amount that you need to like thrive and have an adequate amount of muscle mass. So often these reference ranges are really like the bare minimum, but you ideally want to be uh, much higher than them. And so we should talk more about the testosterone side of this too, because there's this kind of like uh, exacerbated problem with testosterone uh, and fertility. So as previously mentioned, testosterone levels have been declining by about 1% per year since 1982. And so testosterone levels are declining and testosterone is, is such an important hormone for men because low testosterone can lead to depression, anxiety, a lot of mental health challenges. It can lead to weight gain. It is just all around bad if you have low testosterone. So, you know, I think some people think about, oh, toxic masculinity, you know, you don't want like the super testosterone guy, but you kind of do you want guys to have higher testosterone? Because if you don't, then you end up with just like a super depressed, malaise male population. And as a guy, a lot of things that you might attribute to other issues, right, that you might think of as like, oh, I'm I'm feeling, you know, very like down, you know, depressed, ennui, anxiety, not feeling motivated for life. A lot of those uh, symptoms can actually stem from low testosterone. It's something that's usually worth looking at for uh, kind of like chronic mental health challenges. And so given this testosterone decline, reading from the book again, it's not surprising that the use of testosterone replacement therapy has increased fourfold among men between the ages of 18 and 45 and threefold among older men in the past 10 years. After all, many men are aware that low testosterone levels can set the stage for muscle loss, abdominal fat, weakened bones, and memory, mood, and energy problems, symptoms many men desperately want to avoid. So again all around bad news having low testosterone. However, many don't realize that low testosterone often correlates with a lower sperm count, but here's the surprising counterintuitive fact of life. Testosterone replacement therapy comes with its own downsides, including lowered sperm count. So we have lower testosterone and then we take TRT to try to replace it and get it back up, but that actually nukes sperm counts even further. And they've actually tried or proposed using TRT as a form of male birth control. And so you, you end up stuck with this like terrible trade-off of you can either have the lower testosterone, but be fertile, or you can have the higher testosterone with supplementation and be infertile. And then you've got this additional problem where once you start supplementing with it, it becomes harder for your body to produce it itself. It becomes like a very bad spiral very quickly. Again, it, not great. Yeah, she says, testosterone replacement therapy has been studied as a method of birth control because 90% of men can have their sperm counts drop to zero while they're on it. So you end up with this this really, really rough trade-off between the two. While we're on this topic of men and some of the challenges that they face in particular, there's this myth that men can kind of have kids whenever, that it doesn't matter how old you are. And while to a certain extent, yes, men don't have the, the same menopause cutoff that women do, it does make a really big difference how old you are and how healthy you are when you try to have kids as a guy. A compelling body of research shows that as men age, particularly as they reach the north side of 40, their sperm is more susceptible to mutation, which can increase the risk that their children will be born with disorders such as autism and schizophrenia or Down syndrome. A man's age also can affect his female partner's miscarriage risk. Studies suggest that for men ages 40 and older, their partner has a 60% increased risk of experiencing miscarriage compared to fathers under 30. The risk appears to be stronger for first trimester pregnancy losses, which are more likely to be chromosomally abnormal. A pregnant woman is more likely to miscarry when her partner's sperm is faulty, but neither partner may realize this. So this feels like it's changed quite a bit in the last decade, but historically there was a lot more of this idea that like, oh, fertility is, is a woman's problem. And that's simply not true. Something that comes through in this book is that men are actually getting hit worse than women by a lot of these, these issues. And part of that, uh, according to the book, appears to be that 
sperm are much more fragile than eggs. They're much more susceptible to mutation and damage. So some of these environmental stressors that could be causing these problems affect men more because the sperm are more fragile. Having kids when you're younger and healthier as a man does make a really, really big difference, assuming that's something that's an option for you. At the very least, being healthier is an option for you, and that seems to have a huge impact on all of this. She has this great line here where she says, the difference is just because a man doesn't hear his biological clock ticking doesn't mean it isn't marking time. So this is something that guys need to think about too. There are two, two other parts of these, these problems that I just want to touch on briefly before we move into what might be causing them. So even when women of, of any age do succeed in getting pregnant, their pregnancies seem to be increasingly threatened these days. In recent years, the rate of miscarriages has been on the upswing among women in the United States, regardless of the expected mother's age. From 1990 to 2011, the risk of miscarriage increased by 1% per year among pregnant women in the United States according to a 2018 study by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It's worth noting that this is the same rate at which sperm count and overall fertility has declined in Western countries. All of these fertility-related rates are going south at approximately the same pace. The new 1% effect is real and worrisome and has nothing to do with income. So it's really kind of a scary combination of factors when you think about it. Men's testosterone is dropping by about 1% per year, which is leading to a host of physical and mental health challenges. Men's sperm count is also dropping by 1% per year, making it harder for them to get their partners pregnant. On top of that, women's miscarriage rate is increasing by 1% per year. So even when they get pregnant, there's a higher chance that that fetus doesn't end up making it. All of it combined starts to get into pretty scary territory where it might not have been as bad 20, 30, 50 years ago when these trends started, but now they're getting really quite frightening and it sheds some light on why we're seeing so much more talk around fertility challenges, around miscarriages today. There is definitely an element of we're able to detect pregnancies earlier and we're certainly more open when we talk about these things now. But the rates of things going wrong is certainly increasing as well. So let's move on and talk about like what might be causing this and where this all might be coming from. Uh, and before we do, if you're watching the video, you can see that I've got all these sticky tabs. Or if you're listening, then you, you can just trust me that I have tons of sticky tabs uh, and highlights in my book. This is how I take notes on everything that I read. It's completely changed the reading game for me. And I use a tool called Readwise to do that. And if you go to readwise.io slash nat, you can get a two month free trial of the app. It's phenomenal. It makes it so easy to pull all of your highlights out of a book. You can just point your phone at the physical book to pull out physical highlights. If you're on Kindle, it'll automatically extract them from the book that you're reading. And then you can save them to wherever you like to save information, whether that's Notion, Evernote, uh, Rome, if you still use that. And it really makes every single book that you read so much more useful. They also have the best in class article reader which is just the Readwise Reader. If you're using like Instapaper or Pocket or anything, it completely replaces that. And it just makes reading articles online such an easier, uh, more joyful experience. So you get that too. Uh, and you can check both of them out at readwise.io slash nat. I use it every day and really, really highly recommend it. So back to fertility, let's talk about what might be causing some of these problems. So one of the scary things is actually that a lot of your fertility is determined before you're born. Yeah. It turns out that a lot of these problems can happen before you're even born. They can happen to you in utero, which is pretty terrifying. Uh, and, and it suggests some of the ways that this is compounded over generations. A lot of these environmental stressors affect us during our lives to some extent, but then the children that we end up having start off with a lower baseline fertility level, and then they get lower from that based on their lifestyle choices and their environmental stressors. To, so then their children come in even lower too. And this is why uh, we, we might have seen it compound like this over the last 50 years where some of the things that started lightly affecting our grandparents weren't enough to make a difference. But now, by the time it's gotten to our generation, it is a big difference. So I'll read you some of the stuff from the book on this. Not only is women's fertility being affected, even if less obviously or dramatically, but sperm quality can be altered by changes that occur when male fetuses are in the mother's womb. At that time, the fetus is affected by the mother's choices and habits, which means that women can serve as conduits for potentially harmful chemicals exposures. Contrary to previous belief, the womb does not protect the fetus against chemical assault, and a developing fetus has few defenses against the infiltration of chemicals. Looked at another way, the most important event in a male's life in terms of sexual and reproductive development occur while he's still in utero. Babies and children are more vulnerable to these chemical assaults than adults. 
but those who are most vulnerable haven't been born. So this is one of the elements that's just so wild and kind of depressing to me is that you could do everything right as an adult, but you might have just been born on a, a lower baseline threshold of fertility and sexual health based on the conditions that uh, you were conceived in. And not necessarily even because of any like bad choices that your mom made, but if she was drinking polluted tap water or living in a area with a lot of lead pollution or some of these other things that could have affected you, there's almost nothing you can do about it. And, but it goes to show how important it is today for mothers to like really protect uh, themselves when they are pregnant because things that they might not think could have any impact like they actually do. Some researchers are wondering if endocrine disrupting chemicals, uh, so endocrine disrupting chemicals are basically like any chemical in the environment that can affect the endocrine system. So basically can uh, affect your, uh, your hormone levels and hormone production. Uh, could be having an effect on intersexuality of one form or another. After all, research has found an association between high prenatal exposure to EDCs, for instance, if a parent had occupational exposure to pesticides or phthalates, and you can often find phthalates in like a lot of plastics, uh, and a higher risk of external genital malformations in male newborns. And researchers at the University of North Texas have explored the physiological pathways through which EDCs can influence sexual differentiation in humans. So we're going to talk about this uh, a little bit more later, but it just kind of comes back to this idea that even before you're born, the amount of this stuff that your mother is exposed to uh, before you're conceived and while you're in the womb can affect your fertility for the rest of your life. So obviously nothing you can do about it now, but if you're having a kid, it's something that's worth thinking about. So there's apparently this really important window uh, when we're developing as a fetus. So the most sensitive time frame for reproductive tract development is the first trimester of pregnancy when the genitals and the germ cells that will produce sperm are being formed, a phase called the reproductive programming window. The period between two and four months of age, often called mini puberty because of the early postnatal surge of androgens, including testosterone, is also thought to be highly sensitive to outside influences. Interestingly, testosterone levels peak at the end of mini puberty and then decline to minimal levels by six months. After that, they remain low until shortly before real puberty. So you have this like tiny spike of uh, testosterone and, and these other uh, hormones while you're in the womb during that first trimester. And then they go back down and don't really surge again until you hit like actual teenage puberty. And so any disruption during that period can dramatically impact the development of the fetus. And so she goes on to say that any influences that change the production of key hormones during this development period will result in anatomical alterations that are profound and permanent. Such interruptions to the regularly scheduled program can lead to results such as low sperm counts, ambiguous genitalia, shorter anagenital distance, and genital birth defects such as undescended testicles. For all these parts to develop normally at this stage, a highly orchestrated cascade of events requires precisely the right dynamics at the right time. It's like a ballet. The corps de ballet has to come on stage at the right time to avoid bumping into the principal dancers. If the choreography or its execution is off, a principal dancer who leaps high into the air expecting to be caught by a partner may get hurt if he isn't there to catch her at the right time. The choreography during the development of the embryo's sexual organs is similarly complex. So many factors are involved that it's a wonder the process works at all. And this all just goes to highlight how important protecting fetus during this period is from all of these like outside stressors and how easily it can get disrupted and how those disruptions can lead to some of these lifelong challenges. And some of these impacts are remarkably significant. So you, you probably know that like smoking is really bad during pregnancy, right? You, you can maybe have a small amount of alcohol safely, but it seems like almost any smoking is bad. Uh, and listen to this. A, a grown man who smokes cigarettes typically experiences a 15% decline in his sperm count, an effect that can be reversed if he quits the habit. However, if an expectant mother smokes during pregnancy, her grown son may experience a decrease in his sperm count of up to 40% that is irreversible. So his whole baseline has been dropped by 40% because of that choice that his mother made, and there's nothing he can do about it. And unfortunately, it's not just chemicals that can have this impact. New research suggests that if an expectant mother experiences significant life stress, such as job loss, divorce, or the death or illness of a loved one early in a pregnancy with a male fetus, her son is at an increased risk for having reduced sperm count fewer progressively modal sperm, and lower testosterone levels at age 20. Obviously, this is not like to create a whole bunch of additional stress for mothers. You know, that's not why she's sharing this information. It's really just to highlight how 
important that period is for particularly males development and to show some of the ways that uh, men in particular might be getting so negatively impacted by all these additional environmental stressors over the last 50 years. We're so fragile during development that even these things that might not seem hugely significant on the surface can drop our lifelong sperm counts by 50 percent. <laughs> it's just wild to consider. Smoking leads us into this topic of what is actually causing a lot of these problems. What are these actual stressors that are affecting so many people's fertility, both uh, as adults, as children, uh, and even in the womb. So it, smoking is a big one. Obviously, uh, smoking as an adult will naturally lower your testosterone and uh, sperm count and such in men. Mothers smoking with children in the womb can dramatically Im impact their future uh, sexual health. But what are some of the other ones? Alcohol is another big one. So uh, she says, during adolescence, for example, teens are particularly sensitive to the effects of alcohol and smoking. And research has revealed that early alcohol consumption as early as sixth grade can delay pubertal development. Uh, developing breast tissue in girls is susceptible to the effects of certain phthalates, leading to increased uh, breast density, pubertal gynecomastia. Breast formation in boys has also been linked with higher blood levels of certain phthalates. So she's kind of like mixing topics here. We're, we're going to talk about phthalates in a little bit, but alcohol can have some impact there. Another big one is actually uh, marijuana and THC. Many younger people in particular currently believe that it's safer to smoke weed than nicotine, but it may be a mistake to think that marijuana is less toxic to sperm. There hasn't been much, re much research on this issue, but it's starting to trickle in. A 2015 study from Denmark found that regularly smoking marijuana more than once a week was associated with a 29% lower sperm count. Even worse, men ages 18 to 28 who used marijuana more than once a week, as well as other recreational drugs, reduced their total sperm count by 55%. Quite a bit, right? If you're mixing marijuana with other recreational drugs, they don't say exactly what those are, but you know, a 50% drop uh, in your fertility. And then more, more on marijuana. Among men undergoing fertility evaluation as a precursor to assisted reproduction, those who used large quantities of marijuana were four times more likely to have poor swimmers and moderate users were nearly three and a half times more likely to have abnormally shaped sperm. Women aren't impervious to such harmful reproductive effects. A 2019 study found that women who smoked marijuana when they underwent infertility treatment with ART had more than double the miscarriage rate of those who did it. So we might think that marijuana is this like very safe drug, we don't have to worry about it, but if you care about fertility, it seems that you do. It seems to pretty significantly impact some of these things in what might not be obvious ways when you're consuming it. Uh, some animal studies suggest that even cannabidiol, CBD, the second most prevalent active ingredient in marijuana, could damage sperm development and reduce the ability of sperm to fertilize an egg, although not much research has been done on the substance. So even CBD, which is marketed as like this even safer, something you just like take very recreationally, take it before bed every night and whatnot, uh, that might be a mistake too, because that could also be impacting your sperm health. Another weird one is actually Tylenol. And Tylenol is something that I feel like we're starting to hear more criticism of. It's starting to become a little more common to talk about it as a more potentially concerning drug than we thought. It, people often mention how much of a bad impact it can have on your stomach. And especially if you combine it with alcohol, that's really bad. But even on its own, it seems like it can have some stomach harming issues. It might have some negative impacts on our brain. And it seems like it can impact uh, our fertility too. What isn't widely known about the U.S. opioid epidemic is that these powerful pain-relieving drugs can increase DNA damage in sperm. And with high doses of opioids, testosterone levels drop significantly. Farther down the main pe the pain medication potency scale, Tylenol, has been shown to cause sperm abnormalities, including DNA fragmentation, and to increase the time it takes to achieve a pregnancy. Moreover, taking high doses of Tylenol can alter the shape of sperm in ways that can compromise their fertilizing capabilities. That's kind of wild that such a casual over-the-counter drug could be hurting our sperm count, hurting our sperm quality when taken regularly, and can actually uh, increase the risk of, of miscarriage in women. When expectant mothers have a low exposure to an anti-androgenic phthalate called DBP, or they don't use Tylenol during pregnancy, the gender difference in language delay in their babies is large. And that's a good thing. There should be some difference between the genders in language delay because young girls typically pick it up earlier than young boys. By contrast, when pregnant women are exposed to high levels of DBP or Tylenol, during pregnancy, there is little difference in language acquisition between boys and girls. 
Simply put, the language development difference between the genders becomes blurred with these chemical exposures. I suspect many other qualities do too. So taking Tylenol during pregnancy might actually have some impact on the sexual health development uh, of children, which we've had two kids now. I don't think anybody told us that. <laughs> they typically don't recommend using Tylenol more than you have to during pregnancy, but it's surprising that such a common and often used drug could have an impact like that. With the Tylenol, there are other common drugs that, that have concerning effects. So every age, women are twice as likely to take antidepressants as men, and the use of these medications increased 64% from 1999 to 2014 for both genders. And the use of SSRIs, selective serotonin uptake, uh, reuptake inhibitors, which are prescribed primarily for depression or anxiety, reduces sperm concentration and motility and increases the percentage of abnormal sperm. In addition to that, for women trying to conceive, some evidence suggests that taking antidepressants may reduce the probability of success in a given menstrual cycle by 25%. So th these drugs are hurting sperm quality and making it harder to get pregnant. So that's obviously not, not helping much at all and doesn't say it here, but it does seem like it could potentially have some effect on unborn children, right, in the womb. If it's having these effects on the adults, it often, all, it seems to pretty much always have an increased effect on unborn children. So then we get to the really big one, which is plastic and phthalates. And this is where she gets some heat for some of the stuff in this book. But she says, in a 2019 article in Psychology Today, a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Georgetown University School of Medicine wrote, It is nothing short of astounding that after hundreds of thousands of years of human history, the fundamental facts of human gender are becoming blurry. There are many reasons for this, but one which I have not seen discussed as a likely cause is the influence of endocrine-disrupting chemicals, EDCs. The question of whether chemicals in our midst are affecting gender identity is a bit like the metaphorical elephant in the room. Obvious and significant, but uncomfortable and difficult to address. One scientific theory suggests that in utero exposure to EDCs, particularly phthalates, which can lower a fetus's exposure uh, to testosterone, may play a role. These chemicals have been associated with an increased risk of autism spectrum disorder, ASDs, in males. Interestingly, ASD and gender dysphoria, two seemingly unrelated conditions, occur together more often than expected. Another theory is that endocrine-disrupting chemicals, EDCs, can interfere with complex biochemical pathways in the brain in ways that may affect how a person associates with his or her physiological sex at birth or expresses their gender through behavior, either of which may result in gender dysphoria. And so this is a topic she comes back to a lot, is these EDCs, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, do have quite a significant impact on us as adults in, in our day-to-day -day life, but also when we're developing in the womb. And it goes back to something we've seen a few times, like with Tylenol, like with alcohol, with smoking, that these things do lower our fertility markers in various ways when we have them in our life, and they can really impact us if they affect us uh, as fetuses or as children. So let's talk about these like plastics and phthalates. A large diverse class of chemicals phthalates are found in plastic and vinyl, floor and wall covering, metal, medical tubing and medical devices, and toys, as well as in a vast array of personal care products, including nail polishes, perfumes, hairsprays, soaps, shampoos, and others. Phthalates are widely distributed throughout the body and can be measured in urine, blood, and breast milk. The most concerning are those that can decrease the production of male hormones, such as testosterone, that the male needs to become fully masculinized changes that can make him more likely to be infertile or to simply have a lower sperm count. In this respect, there are three particularly bad, uh, which are DEHP, DBP, and BPZP. It don't make that much sense to like listen to me talking about them. You'd have to check if any products in your life have these. And the list of products that can have them is pretty extensive. This is one of the hardest parts of getting these influences out of our system. Uh, because of their reproductive toxicity, these three phthalates are scheduled to be gradually phased out in the European Union along with others, but that's not the case in the United States. She goes on and talks about some of the ways that it affects us. So these can all reduce semen quality, lower testosterone levels, reduce a longer time to achieving pregnancy. Men with higher exposure to phthalates during adulthood also tend to have lower sperm counts and abnormally shaped sperm. They're just really bad news. And these are some of the harder ones to uh, get out of your system because of all the types of products that you have to really meticulously evaluate or just avoid using. And it's not just men who get affected by them. Uh, they're bad news for women's ovaries too. High levels of phthalate exposure have been linked with anovulation when they don't release an egg during a menstrual cycle. 
and polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS, a hormonal disorder involving abnormal ovarian function and elevated levels of androgens. And PCOS is another thing that's been increasing in frequency quite a bit over the last 30, 50 years. Uh, they can also move up the timing of menopause and heavy exposure to phthalates from personal care products in particular is associated with a greater frequency of hot flashes in women aged 45 to 54. Yet most women don't realize that their grooming practices may come with this hidden cost to their well-being at midlife. And again, a lot of these products have been banned in Europe and other places, but not nearly as much in the U.S. A lot of companies are trying to get them out of their products in the U.S. because people know about this more and are asking for it. But if you're not looking for it, it's there's a decent chance that you're getting exposed to it through things that you might be putting on your body. And then the last big one that we'll talk about briefly is just pesticides. So pesticides, including herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides, also can have adverse effects on humans' health, including our reproductive potential and endocrine systems. Depending on the chemical agent, these effects can include competitive binding to estrogen, progesterone, or androgen receptors. Alternatively, they can inhibit androgen or estrogen production, availability, or action, or potentially increase the production of female hormones such as estrogen or progesterone. And this is one that's been really challenging because obviously some of these pesticides and herbicides are how we can have so many people in the world today, but they have these awful unintended side effects. So DDT was used quite widely for a while and now we know it's toxic, but some of the things it's been replaced with like glyphosate that we talked about a lot in the What Your Food Ate episode, episode number one, can have some of these harmful effects as well. When DDT was also found to be neurotoxic, it was replaced with organophosphate pesticides, another class that also has neurotoxic effects that interfere with the child's brain development. And this is kind of a common thread with both environmental toxins and some medications that we'll discover something is killing us or harming us and then we'll replace it with something else and that other thing will turn out to be worse. It's just the thing that doesn't happen to be illegal yet. We're maybe seeing this with some of the trans fats into seed oils, polyunsaturated fat uh, type replacements as well, that just because something is new and replacing an old bad thing doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually good. We might just not know that it's bad yet. You've probably seen like BPA free on plastics and things. That's because we found out that BPA was an endocrine disruptor. It was really harmful to us. We started removing it from plastics. But uh, bisophenol S was substituted for BPA in many products touted as being BPA free. It has become apparent that BPS also may interfere with endocrine function in ways that could promote premature puberty, obesity, and damage to a woman's eggs. And she says, I'm sure you get the picture. When you, see, It's almost like a red flag if you see something uh, marked as BPA free or like X free, because it probably means they've replaced it with something else that might have just as bad of effects. So if you think that like using BPA free plastic gives you a free pass, it probably doesn't. It's probably just as bad, maybe worse, maybe better. We don't really know, but it's not going to be totally safe the way you would hope a marker like that would indicate. Okay, so that was kind of like a long and somewhat depressing exploration of everything that's wrong. So what can we do about it, right? What, 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 can, what steps can we actually take? What actions can we, can we take to try to avoid these problems, reverse them, anything like that? And she does do a great job of laying that out in the end of the book. She has this whole personal protection plan to make sure that these, these factors aren't overly negatively impacting you. For men in particular, you're going to have a certain baseline fertility level that was set at birth based on the circumstances of how you were born, but you can move it around quite a bit outside of that based on your lifestyle choices. So the first one, it is exercise. Men who get more than seven hours per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity have 43% higher sperm concentrations than those who exercise an hour or less per week. More recently, a study of potential sperm donors in China found that men with the highest levels of moderate to vigorous physical activity have significantly higher sperm motility. So basically, the more you can exercise regularly and vigorously, the better your sexual health as a male is going to be. Well, it's something that we kind of knew intuitively, it just seems right. And you could maybe argue that the causality runs in the other direction, that the high testosterone men exercise more. But I think it's pretty clear that the more you get yourself to exercise, the more your, your sexual health improves. When men who were sedentary and obese took up exercising at a moderate intensity on a treadmill for 35 to 50 minutes three times per week, their sperm count, motility, and morphology improved after 16 weeks. So only four months to see a noticeable improvement, which is 
quite good, honestly. And you just have to be careful that you're not over exercising so much that you tank your health because that can happen, particularly in runners. People who run a ton can have really decreased testosterone levels and sperm counts. So you just want to make sure that you're not overdoing it. Another one is reducing stress. So, and this one really affects both men and women. A negative stress can take a toll on reproductive health, uh, possibly leading to hormonal abnormalities, irregular periods, and ovulation problems in women, and the reduction of sperm quality in men, especially if the stress is excessive. But here's one interesting aspect about it. Men who had high work stress and high levels of social support had perfectly normal sperm. So there may be some balance here where you can have more stress as long as you have a good community around you. But if you're super overstressed and you have no community, then the effects could be much worse. Another one is avoiding any exposure to pesticides and herbicides. I mean, really the only reliable way to do that is to buy organic whenever you can and to ideally buy local organic food because that's gonna have the lowest chance of having uh, unwanted pesticide exposure. And she also says that if it's not practical or if it's too expensive to eat all organic, you can look up lists of the most sprayed foods and just try to avoid those. For example, like wheat, corn, and soy are some of the most sprayed foods in the country and cutting those out often makes people feel better. That's why a lot of people think they have gluten sensitivity is because they're actually removing excessive exposure to these different herbicides and pesticides by removing wheat from their diet. And this goes for non-produced foods as well. So if you're having packaged foods, I mean, probably just avoid packaged foods in general. Uh, and really avoid processed foods because processed foods are more likely to have some of these other stressful elements in them. And then in terms of anything that's in a package, it's tough because you really don't, it, you, like, you can't trust BPA free because <laughs> whatever they're replacing the BPA with is probably bad too. But if you can find stuff that comes in like glass or cans instead of coming in plastic, that's usually going to be a little bit safer. And then the same thing goes for meat. You want to avoid having meat that could have antibiotics, growth hormones, anything in it. If you're buying like grocery store meat, you've got a decently high risk of being exposed to that. That's why it's pretty much always best to get your meat from like a local ranch or a place where you know exactly where it's coming from and you're confident that they're using um, much healthier, sustainable uh, rearing practices for their animals. Another one that you may have heard of because it's getting more recognition now is to upgrade your cookware so that you're not using any non-stick cookware. A lot of non-stick cookware like Teflon has these, uh, these like chemicals, these phthalates, is it phthalates? I'm not sure it's that specifically, but it is endocrine disrupting chemicals that can leach into the food when you cook on it, especially if it gets uh, cut at all. So replacing all of those, you know, using stainless steel, cast iron, uh, good ceramic pans is a good way to get off of the non-sticks. And the same thing goes for your like food storage containers. So not storing things in Ziplocs or other plastics, but using glass ideally as what you store things in. Another really big one is the water that you drink. So water, e even if you live in a country or a city that supposedly has good tap water, it often has a ton of extra contaminants that are just kind of like allowed to be in it because it's too hard to get them out. And so adding a more aggressive uh, tap water filter to your house can really, really help with reducing your exposure to these chemicals. One for your drinking water is kind of like the bare minimum that you want. Uh, ideally, a whole house filter is the best because then you're not getting it on your hands or on your body or in your hair when you're like washing and showering. It's not getting in your clothes when you're washing your clothes, but that can be quite expensive. We had a whole house filter installed and it cost, I think like $8,000 all in. So it's not a cheap investment, but at the very least getting a good under counter filter for your drinking water can help uh, get some of it out of the, the water that you're drinking. And then the last big one is all of your skincare products. So if you use any moisturizers or shampoos, conditioners, creams, makeup, if you're using nail polish, really anything that you're putting on your body, you have to be kind of worried about the potential endocrine disrupting chemicals in it. Uh, and so doing a really thorough audit of those to make sure that there's nothing in them that you need to be worried about. And that's going to vary a lot based on uh, what it is you're using. I've personally found that you need a lot less of those products than you think, especially for men. I don't use any shampoo or conditioner uh, and it's fine. <laughs> Your air just gets used to it. Uh, it doesn't smell bad or get oily or anything. It really doesn't need it. So you, you can cut out a lot of stuff and stuff you can't cut out. You can often find better versions. Like for soap, I use like a pure tallow based soap. So there's like literally no other chemical in it besides cow fat and then like a little bit of like a lavender essential oil. The nice thing with some of these products is you can often look for labels like paraben free and phthalate free and that can help you make sure that you're getting something a little bit cleaner. So she has other other tips that you can follow that will really help, right? Like 
not tracking too much stuff in your house with your shoes, uh, preventing dust from building up, not letting medications get into the water supply, not using too many air fresheners. What else does she have here? Preparing meals at home because you never know what sourcing restaurants are doing. So there, there's a bunch more in here. It is worth reading the book. Uh, and the last thing that I want to end on, because this is just a really good idea to keep in the back of your head with, I think, health stuff in general, is how long it takes for some of this stuff to become common knowledge. In 1898, UK factory inspector Lucy Dean warned of the harmful effects of exposure to asbestos. More than a decade later, in 1911, experiments on rats raised reasonable grounds for suspicion that exposure to asbestos dust is harmful to the health of living creatures. Between 1935 and 1949, an alarming number of lung cancer cases were reported among asbestos manufacturing workers. And in 1955, research established a high risk for lung cancer among asbestos workers. Between 1959 and 1964, mesothelioma cancer was found to be a significant problem in asbestos manufacturing workers. And nevertheless, it took until 1973 for all forms of asbestos to be recognized as carcinogenic and until 1999 for many countries in Western Europe to ban the use of all types of asbestos. It took 100 years for it to become common knowledge. And that's it was sort of the same thing with trans fats. It took almost 100 years from when they started being used for us to realize how bad they were. Same thing happened with smoking. Doctors were still posing for cigarette commercials 20 to 30 years after the first research came out about how harmful cigarettes were. So if you wait on some of this stuff, then you might be dead. <laughs> right? You're, you're, you're going to wait much longer than you need to. The information on things that are harming us is often out there if we know where to look for it. And it does seem like fertility issues are becoming a growing problem. They're indicative of a lot of other health concerns that we need to be aware of and think about. And there is a lot that we can do to try to protect ourselves, our families from letting this become a bigger and bigger concern. The last thing that I'll mention is especially for men listening, there are really good at-home fertility tests you can do. And that might just give you an indicator of if there's anything you need to worry about here. It's a couple hundred dollars. You don't have to go to a doctor's office. I did one when my wife and I started thinking about having kids and it was just really useful to get that data. So that is something that you can consider if you're curious about this at all. Aside from that, if you enjoy the show, please let a friend know about it. That is the best way for this podcast to grow. It's super helpful. If you've already told a friend, then please either leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, like, subscribe on YouTube, anything like that just really helps the show get out there more. Aside from that, pick up Countdown by Dr. Shauna Swan. Check out readwise.io slash net, and I'll see you next time.